All right, so listen, we are continuing our series, Signs of Growth. Um, and, and if you haven't been following with us, I, I just wanna let you know that we're, we're trekking with the story of David to try and discover clues about our own spiritual progress, right? That's what it means, signs of growth. And, and, and listen, even if you are just vaguely familiar with, with this guy, David, I mean, everybody knows David. Um, I'll tell you, there is one moment in his life um, that jumps out as most memorable to people. And of course, that is the story of David versus the giant Goliath. You know, the, 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 the courageous boy against the mighty giant. Like most people have heard that story. And, and I'll tell you, there's a lot to consider in it. There, there's a lot to really think about. And because even before David steps onto the battlefield, he's faced with a very critical decision that will determine his outcome. Now, what's really interesting is the fact that that is the exact same choice that we all face at some point in our growth journey. And so that's what we're going to go for today. We're going to dive right in with and see how David grows from freedom to wisdom. Let's pray. Uh, God, thank you so much for another opportunity to, to dive into your word to learn from you, to hear from you, to become um, what you see, God, what you desire, what you want us to be. And we say yes to you, sir. Take this moment, dear God, inform us and shape us by your powerful word um, so that we would be pleasing to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, now here's the scenario because the Philistines um, they, they were a group of people who were considered to be the enemies of Israel, God's people Israel. And, and, and so what you see is a recurring tension between them throughout the Old Testament story. Um, they, they were an aggressive and what I would say a militant people um, who were known for their superior weaponry. Um, uh, the reason for this is because they held somewhat of a monopoly on the iron industry in that particular time and in that area. Uh, this means that, that Israel, um, th they were subject to them in many regards, right? In many regards. For, for example, they couldn't even sharpen their tools for their daily labor without depending on the Philistine expertise, right? So, so you see they're dependent there. And of course, when it came to the armies, well, there's, there's really no comparison. There's really no comparison. The Philistines had all the weaponry and they, they had all the, the training and, and the use. So, so, so they were uh, superior to the Israeli army. At one particular point, the Bible records that only the people, the only people in Israel, in their army who actually had a sword was King Saul and his son, Jonathan. So, so that gives you a picture of, of, of the dynamics between the two armies. And, and, and of course, the perspective is important because when you read about their battles and you read about the conflicts between Israel and Philistine, you need to know the odds. <laughs> like you, you need to know the odds. It wasn't even a contest, right? In terms of military might, Israel was completely overmatched and they knew it. But not only that, not only did Israel know, the Philistines knew it too. All right, so if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel 17. We're going to pick up at verse 4. We're going to look at this particular encounter between the Philistines and the Israelites. Um, verse 4, it says this, A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. That, that's like just, just lower than 10 feet, just shy of 10 feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor, a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze graves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? 
Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now, I'll, I'll pause right there because uh, let me just say that the dynamics that are happening here and, and you see the, the swagger, the, the, um, the boldness of, of Goliath. Let me, let me just say, you, you carry yourself just a little bit different when you know you can't lose. Right. Your, your, your talk is a little different. Your walk is a little different when 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 you're in a situation and you are confident about the outcome. Right. Have you ever been there? Maybe maybe it's a project at work or something you have going on and you know you got it under control. You are absolutely certain that this is going to work out in your favor. Have you ever been up for like a, a guaranteed win? Right. You, you just carry yourself a little different whenever that's the case. And that's how it was with the Philistines. They had absolutely no regard at all for anyone that they might would face, right? Now let's jump to the other side. Let's jump to the other side for Israel. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt like you can't win? Like, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't, doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter what the circumstances might be. The challenge that is in front of you is too much for you to overcome. It is too much for you to handle. Have you ever felt defeated before you ever started to fight? That's where Israel was. That, that's how they felt. That's how they saw themselves in light of the mighty Philistines. Now, 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 here's the deal, because I want to give you the picture that's happening here. They converge on the Valley of Elah for a battle. And, and I want you to imagine the Philistines are on, on one side on one hill and the Israelites on the other side, on, on their camped out on the other hill. And the battle line is down in the valley. And, and the armies are stationed up high where everybody could see everything unfold. And, and understand, listen, the perspectives that are viewing the moment are very different. Like for the Philistines, this is sport, right? This is sport. It is no big deal at all. In many ways, they are entertaining themselves at the expense of Israel because they're so confident of their superiority. So, so in order to make it a contest, in order to challenge themselves just a tad bit, what they do is they say, listen, we know y'all can't beat all of us, but we, we'd be willing to bet that you can't even beat one of us. But we, we'd be willing to put it all on the line that you can't even beat one of us. So send down your best warrior and we'll send down ours and whoever wins, wins for everyone. Now I'll pause right there. Let's pause right there because I need you to understand that the Bible tells many different stories just to tell you one story. It gives you many different perspectives and many different examples just to tell you one underlying truth, just to kind of connect with you on the basis of your current reality. Like you might feel overwhelmed. You might feel like you are in over your head. You might feel like no matter what you do, you cannot win. But I need you to understand that a win for the right one is a win for everyone. I need you to pay attention to, to, to what's happening here. A win for the right one is a win for everyone. Too many people fail to choose the right champion to fight on their behalf. Listen, do you know that in whatever you are facing right now, whatever you are up against, whatever you are intimidated by, do you understand that there is someone who will fight for you? There's someone who will fight for you. Listen, too many people are busy fighting their own battles. And, and listen to me. Yes, that's courageous. Yes, that's brave. Yes, that's commendable. But I'm telling you, none of those things will guarantee a win. None of those things will guarantee victory. Let me just tell you, you can be unafraid to fight 
and still be unprepared to win. You, you can be unafraid to fight and still unprepared to win. It ain't always about being brave. Listen, you could take a brave beating. L listen to me in this. You, you can take a brave beating and you may say, well, court, of course, at least I learned something. Yes, you learned that you need more than bravery to win. That, that, that's what you learned. We, we watch too many movies, right? We, we, listen, those hero movies, the scenes are edited. Like, that, 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 that's not real. Your, your life is live action. Do you understand that? And courage is great, but there's more that's required if you want to actually win. This is where David steps onto the scene. Of course, his older brothers are, are fighting in, in Israel's army, but David is too young, so where is he? He's out in the field tending sheep, right? And his dad sends for him to take supplies to his brothers at camp. And so he gets there and he finds out what's going on in this. Like there's this big, clumsy Philistine clown who's down in the valley, who's talking trash, beating his chest, mocking our God, and the entire Israel army is on the other side shaking in their boots. David is like, what in the world? He is, he is furious, so much so that he rose up on King Saul. Listen to what he says to him at verse 32. He says, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Now, now I'm going to pause right there because there's a whole lot going on in David's little speech there. But let's just pause because listen, this brother killed a lion and a bear. A lion and a bear. That is remarkable to me. That is remarkable, because listen, I'm pretty sure one of them would have got me. I'm, I'm pretty sure, I don't know if it would have been the lion or the bear or, but one of, I, I, I couldn't handle both of them, right? I, I, that's too much, a lion and a bear, that's too much. That's too much. And listen, I don't know if you read the Bible the way that I read the Bible, but listen, I pay attention to the word. I, I pay attention. It said, it said they carried off a sheep from the flock. A sheep, that's singular. That's just one sheep. Now listen, I gotta do the math on that. I gotta, he's probably got hundreds of sheep to care for. Hundreds of sheep, and they, they came after one sheep. Listen, I'm taking the L on that one, if that's me. If I'm David in that situation. Matter of fact, I would've went to my dad, I would've went to Jesse and told him, listen, that's just a sacrificial lamb that, that saved all the others. I would've took the L on that. Maybe you would have too. <laughs> but David had a very different perspective. Listen, listen, he said, he said, I killed the lion and the bear, but it was the Lord who rescued me from them. It was the Lord. Uh, matter of fact, why, why don't you just pause just for a moment and practice saying that? It was the Lord. I used to hear my grandmother say all, all the time, like she, she, she would say, I know where my help comes from. There, there, there is there's what I've done. David says, there's what I've done. I've killed the bear. I've killed the lion. But it was the Lord who rescued me. Listen, do you know where your help comes from? Do you know? Listen, maybe the reason that God hasn't trusted you with his success is because you haven't learned to credit him as your source. 
There's a correlation there. There's a connection. Maybe the reason he hasn't trusted you with his success is because you haven't learned to credit him as your source. Something to consider, something to really think about. And we see an example in David here. Now, now here's the deal, because Saul hears all this, you, you know, and he gets, he gets excited. He, he, he believes more and more that maybe he's found a solution, right? I understand at this point, Saul is, is embarrassed. He's desperate because he's supposed to be the king. And this giant Philistine is making him look small perhaps for the first time in his life. Because if you don't know, the Bible said that Saul was a head taller than everybody else in Israel. He was a, a full head taller. This is why they chose him as king, because he looked the part, right? And now you've got an enemy who looks more imposing than you. So, so Saul is desperate. Saul is on edge here. But David presents an intriguing option. Now, now watch what happens in this, because I don't want you to forget we are looking for signs of growth here. I, I want you to pay attention. Let's pick up at verse 38. It says, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I'll pause right there because Saul tried to give David his armor and, and his sword to use. Now, that sounds noble, sounds honorable. It sounds like Saul is, is concerned for David and he really wants to help him in this. Uh, David's willingness and his faithfulness has opened up a new door for him. I, I want you to pay attention. He, he has access at the highest level possible at this point. He has access at the throne. The king is bending over backwards to give him whatever he needs. He can even use that which is you that which is reserved for the king's personal use. This is Saul's armor. Nobody else uses this. This is Saul's sword. Nobody else uses this. This is reserved for the king. And now David has access. He is free to choose the very best that the world has to offer. Now, now I need you to pause and back out of the story for just a moment, because what I need you to really see here is what's happening with David. This is a moment. This, this, this is a test. This is a part of his preparation that's unfolding with this opportunity. David is being sized for a crown. He, he's being sized for the crown he's supposed to wear. And I'm telling you, we don't know what to do with this. We, when we hit moments like this in our own lives and we find ourselves with access that we have never imagined, listen, options reveal true values. Options will reveal what you really, truly value. The only way to prove that you've really changed is to be given the freedom to choose the same old thing. That's the only way that you know. So understand, we don't really know what to do with freedom. We, we want it, we chase it, but then when we get it, we don't know what to do with it. And so what we typically do is we default. What we typically do is we choose to trust the wrong things. What we typically do is we choose to wear other people's armor. In David's case, this is the king's armor. Imagine how nice it was. You spent your whole life admiring his armor from afar. You, you've heard stories of battles that the king has won, of the things that he's done, all while wearing his armor. And now you have a chance to wear his armor, to accomplish something extraordinary in the name of the Lord. What do you do? What do you do? Signs of growth. Signs of growth. The most important growth moments in our life are those that invite us to use freedom to choose wisdom. They are those that invite us to use our freedom to choose wisdom. Wisdom. See, you have more options now, but you also know that more is at stake. 
and you can take advice and counsel and support from others, for, from all the voices that are trying to weigh in on your moment, that's important for you to do, but don't you dare listen to others without discerning the Lord's voice. Don't you dare just go along with what worked for somebody else. You have to discern. You have to discern, here's the deal, if Saul's armor and sword were really that effective in this situation, then why doesn't Saul just put them on and go down and fight the giant himself? You have to discern. See, understand, Saul is playing the odds here. <laughs> if David happens to win, wearing his armor and using his sword, then the people will credit the victory to his graciousness, not the Lord's. Do you see this? You have to learn to use your freedom, to choose wisdom. Now look at what happens. Verse 39. David says, I cannot go in these. This is what he says to Saul. Because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with the sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Now I'll stop right there because it's so amazing to me the decision that David makes in this moment. Gosh, man, you have access to the best. You have access to that which everybody else would want. You have access to the things that most people would think would be in your best interest. I can imagine what his brothers may have been saying, what the other soldiers may have been saying or how they viewed the moment. But David says, you know what? I, I'm not used to this. I'm not used to this. He, he says to Saul, look, bro, I appreciate all the help you offered, but I can't be you. You won't even be you and go face the giant. Listen, I admire and I honor you and I want to serve you. But listen, just because something worked for you in your past, it doesn't mean it's going to work for me in my future. I might be young, but I'm wise enough to know where my help comes from. And I have an experience with the Lord. <laughs> He's rescued me from some moments, from some situations. He's been with me in facing some terrible and some scary things. I've had to put my trust in him and nothing else. I've had to put my trust in him. And so in this moment, when I'm facing that which you are afraid of and you are putting your trust in armor and swords, I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. I have an experience with him. He has showed up for me in ways that I can't even explain for you. I'm wise enough to know where my help comes from. Listen, that's David. But what about you? What about you? Are you wise enough to know where your help comes from? Can, can you look back over your life? Have there been any moments, any situations that you found yourself in and you don't know how you got yourself through, but you got through? You don't know how you were able to overcome, but you overcame. You, you don't know what happened. You just know something happened. Are you wise enough to understand where your real help comes from? It matters, the faithfulness that the Lord has demonstrated to you in the past. You use that to fuel faith in him for moving forward. Sometimes you have to just remember. I love how David recounts his story. 
He says, I don't know what battles you've been in. I don't know what you've experienced, but I know what I've walked through and I know who's carried me through. And the one who carried me through then will carry me through right now. Are you wise enough to know where your help comes from? Sometimes we need to just pause and remember. It's why it's so important to come to the table of the Lord. For, for those who've been following the Lord for, for some time, he says, remember. He says, remember, and he invites us to his table where he explains the help that he has offered to all of us. If you haven't accepted him, if you haven't put your faith in him, if you haven't trusted him, you may not fully understand. And so Jesus is with his disciples and he's explaining the particular type of help that he offers to all of humanity. He says, this bread represents my body that's been broken for you. You couldn't stand in the gap for yourself. You, you couldn't fight against sin on your own. This bread represents my body to let you know that I have waged war against all that is waging war against you. I've done it on your behalf to the point where my body has been broken for you. If you believe that, take the bread and eat. Likewise, he takes the cup and he says, this cup represents my blood that has been poured out for you. I told you I'm warring for you. I'm fighting battles for you. When you couldn't stand up for yourself, when you deserve death for yourself, I laid down my life for you on your behalf. I shed my blood for you. If you believe it, take the cup and drink. And he says, because you do believe, because you do believe, my win, my victory is your victory. The battle that I fought for you you get to receive the benefit of it. When I win, we win. It is for my glory, but it is for your benefit. You believe that? You believe that in the same way that David was willing to face the giant on behalf of all of Israel, that the Lord Jesus himself was facing the giant of sin for all of humanity. He did that for me and he did that for you. If you believe it, I wanna pray for you. I thank you so much. We receive your sacrifice right now, God, in, in, in all its fullness. We pause long enough to consider the risk you took. The risk of doing something that we wouldn't even appreciate. We pause to consider um, the suffering that you endured in a way that we would never be able to understand, dear God. You did it for us. You fought the battle on our behalf. And we're grateful. We're grateful, God, that you would share your victory with all of us. We receive you now to be a part of your family, a part of your celebration, and we will give you glory and honor forevermore. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.